base 12. Yes. And probably 13, right? They're short. All those that are justified, God uh, vouchsafes and, and for his only son, Jesus Christ, to make partakers of the grace of adoption by which they are taken into the number and enjoy the liberties and privileges of the children of God. Have his name put upon them, receive the spirit of adoption, have access to the throne of grace and boldness, with boldness, are enabled to cry, Abba, Father, are pitied, protected, provided for, and chastened, chastened by him as by a, a father. He had never cast off by uh, seal to the day of redemption and inherit, inherit the promises as heirs of everlasting salvation. Great, thank you. So, um, yeah, this may be pretty easy to understand. Maybe what we could do is, uh, what, what part of that stands out to you? What part of that paragraph stands out to you? <clears throat> but I think that for me, the, the First words seem to um, track the words in Romans eight, where it's you know, in grace we be justified, be also glorified. And so for me, it's kind of if we're just saying, okay, those he justified, this other thing is going to happen too. Um, so it's a precondition to his adoption, is the justification aspect. I think. Um, idea of vouchsafing, I guess, just reminds me of the, the seal, you know, the guarantee that the Spirit is the, is that guarantee that He will um, adopt us, that we are, we have been adopted, actually. It's, it's, the, it's like if you, you have this image of somebody going into an adoption place and signing for you already. Uh, you're his, you're hers, so I think it's that kind of settles the matter. Yeah. Yeah. Great. How about others? What what stands out for you? I think the first one that stood out to me was um, have access to the throne of grace with boldness. Mm -hmm. And especially the the last word boldness and makes me think about um i think like my life and i think christians as a whole sometimes and how i think a lot of them or maybe not all but many sometimes face the issue of like being proud of their faith especially like in today's culture and society we don't want to be like too religious or we, we don't want it to be part of our identity too much and stuff like that which well, like I don't, I don't think we agree with, but it's kind of like the reality that happens, I think. Yeah. And also like the second line where it says, by which they are taken into the number. I don't really know what that means. Like what is the number? Mm. Anyone have an answer for that? Yeah, I think so. Um, Paul makes reference to it a couple of times, and I think it's just the, there is a um, the elect of God. There is a number of them, obviously finite, they're not infinite, and that's what I think he's getting to. But you know, there's some passages that talk about Jesus coming with his ten thousand, some thousands of saints or whatever. So it kind of reminds me of you know, those are the ones. 
of the number as it were. Um, so it, it talks about the body of believers very specifically and how they're counted. And remember, in Israel in the Old Testament, they, they were always counting, right? Back to the book of numbers, right? In which they counted the number of Jews there were. Is there a reason why uh, here they would they choose this word specifically instead of just saying like the elect? I guess to, to point out that there's a finite number. Because if you say the elect, it doesn't communicate that. I think that's a good question. Um, yeah. That is a good question about why they would choose one word over another. Um, but yeah, I think what Daniel says is that when it uses the word number, it just shows that it is finite. It's not, it's not like everyone is an elect. But all those that are justified, that are elect, are counted as part of that group of elect. How about you, Steve, for example? You know, this past days, I was trying to gather some information about, like, to help a friend in Brazil. He wanted to uh, say no, 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 to he wanted to provide or uh, have an ID for them uh, for their, their children. But he wasn't married officially. But his children are his children. And then I went to the household office to got some information, to get information back. And they told me Oh, your friend cannot adopt their own own sons. Mm. He has to recognize, not adopt. Mm. They, they were talking in Chinese. I couldn't understand the word, the meaning, but it was new, new word for me. Mm. Then I checked the dictionary because the Brazilian, the Taiwanese embassy in Brazil, they said adoption. Mm. So they used the wrong word. Then for in Chinese the adoption is so young, but I my friend couldn't so young. He has to run me. Mm. I doesn't like recognize. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's different situation I want uh, to solve this problem. Mm. But for us, I think. It doesn't matter. God, because of His grace, recognized us and He also adopted us like His sons. Mm -hmm. And these steps cannot be changed. Mm -hmm. and, well, and different, differently from any government. We don't need papers for that. Something that God just keep us really elect us for this because some people they are not elected. Let, let, let's say in this situation, if the Taiwanese government just grant my friend sons a free adoption or recognition, whatever the word, for free. Well, wow, it would be a blessing, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's like this much easier. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Yeah, I think for me, um, one of the the things that I share with uh, people in the past is that <clears throat> just with my own uh, my own experience growing. I called my dad the equivalent of Papa Father. In Korean, there's a, a formal way to say dad, like father, but then there's also a, like a, a kid way of saying a daddy. Um, and 
funny thing is I, I still call him that right now. Um, but but the relationship between my father and I is that growing up we never really we never really hugged. I felt like we never really uh, uh, were that close. And so like I just call him daddy, but then the relationship still felt more like father and son. Um, and so sometimes when I think about this idea of adoption and being enabled to cry of our father, these ideas are still a little bit foreign to me. Like I have to, I have to keep believing it, I have to keep trusting it, I have to keep uh, trying to understand more of what that means. But but the feeling that I have is still kind of like distant. It's more natural for me to, to see God as a distant God that is powerful, that's holy, that's wonderful in, in his works, but not really see him as a, a close father, like a close dad. Um, and that's just, that's just my own struggle. wrestling with to understand how how God is a close God. So like the idea of like having access to the throne of grace with boldness. Um, like I can imagine the throne and I can have access to it, but I better show respect. I better do things the right way. I better uh, you know make sure that that everything's right, correct. Otherwise, I'm, I'm going to get it. And there's this, there's this uh, lack of boldness to enter the throne of grace. And I'm not able to fully say, Abba Father. And I've, I've grown a lot over the years, but, but this is just who I am more naturally because of my relationship. So anyways, that's something that's stuck out to me. Well, I think that that's, that's true. I think that actually every single person who's had a father, because some people haven't had fathers, so they don't know they uh, have, there's, there's obviously an identity issue with father and my father, and so this issue of breaking free from that and seeing the idea of father is just really hard when you don't have a reference point for that. Yeah. Um, but one thing I take comfort from is that it's basically adoption tells you you were fatherless. That's the, the, what's communicated. Is if you didn't have a father and he just rescued you from that father, you had no father at all. And that implies that you shouldn't look to the father on earth for that relationship. That it's a very special and distinct relationship never had in this world and cannot be compared. And I think that's the, the thing I want to take away. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's good. Yeah. Okay, so I think yeah. that's actually a really um, unique concept for me of having like um, like we're adopted to his family and he's our father but like we kind of think like, oh yeah, he's our father, but then we also have our father here. Yeah. But then like, the fact of his uniqueness of being a, a parent to us is something I didn't really consider or think deeply on. Just like, you wouldn't see children with multiple adopted fathers, right? It's, you know, it just doesn't happen. It's not a thing. So I think it's the same thing. It's like, where we shouldn't have like two, we can't serve more than one master. I think it's like looking to that father figure for like a spiritual one or a godly one. You can't look to like multiple sources as well. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think one thing that I've learned over the years is that as I've come to understand that God is my father, um, you know, like people have other kinds of like fathers in this world. They have their dad, maybe they have a godfather, maybe they have uh, like uh, an, 
adopted type of father or person that was like a close uh, male figure in your life where he's almost like a father to you. Um, so people have these different figures uh, that they may look to. But one thing that I've come to, to realize is that you know, I do want to look to God more than anyone else and recognize him, like you're saying, as the unique father. And part of the reason why I've come to that, though, is because so many people in the past have disappointed me, too. My pastors, even my own dad, and other people have disappointed me so much that when I look at people now, like, like uh, it, it, it seems a little bit uh, sad to say it this way, but I don't really trust people in a way, I trust people, but I don't trust people in a way where I look up to them almost like uh, some people look at like celebrities, like almost these celebrities are, are flawless, you know, some people they look at certain pastors as these pastors are so great and they're my pastor even though they're not even in their church, they look at these online sermons and stuff and, and then when a person that's, that everyone looks up to falls into some kind of sin. Like the most recent one is there's a guy named Ravi Zacharias. I don't know if you guys know about him or not. But um, there's a lot of things that were found out about him after he passed away. Uh, that people end up, when, when something like that happens, they end up kind of struggling in their own faith because they put so much hope in that one person. So, like for me, this is, this is one thing that, like I said, I'm still growing in, but, but what it's also caused me to do in a different kind of way is that I've, I've realized that you know, anyone on this earth, even my own dad, will fail me in a lot of ways. Uh, but this father will never fail me. Any other thoughts about adoption? There's a lot that could be said here, but... I think it's kind of interesting to note how they, they order these things, right? Like, why did they choose adoption before sanctification? That seems rather deliberate, you know. Why did they put it before sanctification, you know? So that they seem to think that sanctification comes first. Adoption is a concept you should be aware of before you get into the issue of sanctification. As if to say that it's not really related to that, in the sense that... God is going to accept you, no matter the degree of sanctification in your own earthly life that you accomplish, uh, or he accomplishes in you, I better say. The point is, the adoption is that security which should lead you to bear the fruit of sanctification. Yeah. And that's what he's on their mind. Yeah. That's right. That's right. Um, so, some of us, we've gone through gospel centered life. Some of us uh, may may or may not know of this thing called Sonship. It's a program that I've gone through. And uh, Sonship really emphasizes this idea. It actually starts off the whole program with the idea of uh, what an orphan mentality is. And so some of you guys are familiar with this already. But orphan mentality being that even though there is this promise that's found in scripture that we are adopted, that we are children of God, but sometimes when we live our lives, we act like orphans. We act like as if God is not actually there. Our Father is not actually there. Um, so uh, we don't have to go into detail about what that could look like. Uh, but but it's, it's an idea that comes from this idea. But I, the idea of orphan mentality doesn't exist in Scripture. But the idea of adoption does. But, you know, it's possible not to believe. don't believe it or when you forget about it or when you live your life without adoption in mind then then it's possible for us to live with an orphan mentality all right great